Before I do our little poll this morning or quiz or whatever, however you want to think about it, um, ask you questions. <laughs> uh, I wanted to remind you guys about Connect Assignments. And I kind of forgot that I brought Nate up into the different things. And I don't think these really correspond with my lectures, though, like the A, B, and C, because <laughs> I made changes since I set up these assignments. Um, but I just want to alert you guys, right, that we've finished Nate. You should work on these innate ones. And definitely try and work on these adaptive ones. These are for bonus, right? And these are um, the animations, right? So I know some people don't like the animations. And in the past, we've had technical issues with animations not playing on people's devices and stuff like that. So I had made them bonus. Um, so make sure that you are working on those. And then... In the current textbook that we use, they have adaptive and, and the lecture that I do called disorders all lumped in one chapter. Um, so you'll notice that there is no disorders one, even though I have a disorders objective sheet and PowerPoint and stuff. Uh, the disorders are lumped in here with adaptive um, for the current textbook. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. All right. So don't forget about those assignments. Um, exam is, of course, the 28th. Uh, Thursday, uh, the, basically our last class, right, before the final exam. So, um, we the end is near. We're in the race to the finish, right, y'all? Race to the finish. Okay, so go ahead and get out your phones, and let's um, do a little bit of review. So, which of the following is not a product? is not a product. Oh, the website is right here. pollev.com slash Erica Burns. Or you can do the text thing. I don't know. Like you text whatever code it is that the answer is to that number, right? So you like put in this number and then put in the code for the answer if you want to do the texting option. So, um, which of the following is not a product of the innate immune response? Or you could word it, which one is a product of our adaptive immune response? All right. So which one of these is produced by our adaptive immune response? Or which one is not an innate immune response? Could be worded either way, right? Can you put a line under your name for me? Can you put a line under your name for me? Thank you. Oh, of course, and then a whole bunch more people come in. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad I asked this question. So it says, which of the following is not a product of the innate immune response? Another way we could say this is which one of these is part of the adaptive immune response? Which one is a product of our adaptive immune response? Okay, so the good news is a few people got this right. 17% did. The answer is antibodies, right? That's part of our adaptive immune response, right? You guys wait until I say what the correct answer is. It's all good. We don't have clickers, so I don't know who's answering what. But I know my class, right? And so I, I'm like, okay, I'm glad I asked this question, because if I ask a question like it on the test, now you're not going to get it wrong, right? <laughs> Um, so, mucus, remember, is, we're born with this. This is part of our nonspecific innate response. So are defensins. These are those peptides that we produce that will be in our mucus and our tissue fluids. Antibodies are what we just started talking about, right? 
and they're part of our adaptive immune response. These are things that we make as we're exposed, right, as we adapt and change to this changing world. Lysozyme is an enzyme that we produce, right? It's a general, um, non-specific, -spec right? It doesn't target a specific bacteria, but what does it do? What does lysozyme do? No, lysozyme. It's an enzyme. It does something to bacteria. It destroys them by destroying what layer? It destroys peptidoglycan, right? It destroys the cell wall of bacteria. So who's more susceptible to this, gram positives or gram negatives? Positive. Gram positives because they have that very thick exposed layer of peptidoglycan. And then we talked about complement last time, right? These series of proteins, last time and the time before, right? That help protect us. And that's part of our innate response. Okay, so let's do the next one. I have to deploy it. So speaking of... These are complement proteins, right? Which of the following can bind to antigens? C1, C3A, C3B, C5A, or C5B? I feel like who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> I feel like I just sounded like him, too. <laughs> Who wants to be an A student? Okay. No one else is going to respond? Only five of you guys? Oh, you guys are having connection problems? Oh, okay. I did deploy it, though. Some of you guys saw it. Right? Okay. Okay. That works, too. <laughs> when technology fails, notes work. Right? <laughs> okay. So we'll go ahead and... Um, answer this one. Um, the 86% got it. Yay. Right? Do you guys remember the trick that I gave you for remembering this one? The B binds, but I tried to trick you up though. Did you see I put C5B in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That goes into the MAC complex. Good, good, good. So I didn't trick you guys up. Good. So the next question says, or statement, right, because this is true or false, both antibodies in C3B are opsonins that help phagocytic cells attach to antigens. True or false? Oh, I didn't deploy it. Sorry. That would be partly my problem, right? <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I forget about that button sometimes. It'll go. If you text it, it'll go. But those of you guys who are using the web, it won't show up on your phone unless I push this button. And I won't start getting results. So five of you guys think it's false?
Yeah, obstinance means tagged for destruction, y'all. This one's true. This one's true. This one's true. <laughs> Both antibodies and C3B are obstinance, right? They bind to antigens so that phagocytic cells can grab onto them and destroy them. All right, let's try the next one. So this one, you guys actually have to type, right? And there are three possible correct answers. You can just type one of them. What are the three main outcomes of complement activation? Right, so what happens when complement is activated? What happens? This is one of our objectives, so you can guarantee it'll probably be on the test. The good news is on the test, it'll be multiple guess. Alright, what is C3B? What did we just say C3B is? It binds, right? It's an opsonin, right? So binding of C3B is one of the outcomes, right? We produce C3B, it binds, it opsonizes. Okay, so that's one of the things that happens. What is C3A and C5A involved in? Yes. Inflammation. I don't know what happened. You would text into that number? Yeah, text Erica Burns to wants to join, then text your message. Instructions are different, sorry. Ah, we got cell lysis on there finally. Right? So remember the formation of the MAT complex? So three very important outcomes of complement activation is the production of more C3B, which binds, right, opsonizes, tags for destruction, the production of C3A and C5A are important in the inflammatory response, and then the MAT complex, that membrane attack complex, is very important for cell lysis. Antibodies are not a product of complement, right? But antibodies can do what for complement? Via the classical pathway, right? How do we get this whole thing started? Activation, right? There are three main ways in which complement can be activated. Antibodies binding, that's the classical pathway. C3B binding called the alternative pathway, and then the other one is the lictin binding pathway, right, where we're detecting uh, mannose uh, or mannin, a polymer of the sugar mannose. Remember, this is our important um, objective. What happens once it becomes activated, right? We get opsonization with C3B, inflammation because of C3A and C5A and cell lysis via the MAC complex, that membrane attack complex. So having said that too, who is more vulnerable to attack by the MAC complex, gram-negative cells or gram-positive? It's a membrane attack complex. It inserts into membranes, the gram-negative cells, because the gram-negative have what? 
they have an outer membrane that gets attacked by this. Where for gram positives, they have to travel through the cell wall to get to the cell membrane. Remember I promised you guys at the beginning of the semester I would never shut up about gram positive, gram negative. I wasn't kidding. All right, so this is actually an image. So only those of you guys that aren't doing texting that are actually using the web page will be able to do this one. Right, so if you open a web browser and you type in pollev.com backslash Erica Burns, this picture should pop up for you and you should be able to click on the light chains. So hopefully at least a few of you guys are doing a browser. We'll get some answers on here. There's more than one light chain though, right? Because it's plural. Light chains. So make sure we, amongst our class, can get them both. <laughs> okay. So we got them, right? They're the blue ones. Why do we call them light chains? What do you notice about them? They're shorter, they're smaller. That's why they end up being lighter. Right, so that's our light chains. And you have two for an antibody, one on either side. But they're the same protein. Okay. So let's do the next one, which is another picture one. This is an important region right? Where is the FC region of an antibody? A, B, or C? Put your little marker. This one's kind of easy, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm not tricking you on this one. It really is the C one. Mm -hmm. Right, but FC stands for the fraction that crystallized. Right, um, when they were um, investigating antibodies, what what light what makes up the FC portion? Is it light chains or heavy chains? Heavy. It's heavy, right? So notice the labels right there too, right? <laughs> but it's heavy chains, right, that make up this part. And this part we're going to really talk about today because that is going to be the part that determines which class of antibody we're talking about, right? There's five different classes of antibodies. So they all have this general structure for the most part, this, you know, characteristic stick figure of a Y that we've been looking at. Um, when we talk about the different classes, the part that's different that makes it whatever class it is, is this portion. And that's important, too, because remember, this is the portion of the antibody that our immune system interacts with. So we already talked about the different outcomes, right, and about how phagocytic cells will grab onto this portion of an antibody, right? Antibodies opsonize. They tag for destruction. So when something is coded in antibodies, when the phagocytic cell comes along, it actually grabs onto this portion of the antibody. It has a receptor for it. And that's what they grab onto, and that's what aids them in engulfing that pathogen that is coded in antibodies or opsonized. So that portion is really important, right? The FC region of our antibodies. It's made up of heavy chains. So the next thing that's really important about our antibodies is the variable region. So this is the part that changes from antibody to antibody. Right? What's, what makes antibodies different from each other and allows them to bind to different antigens? So where is the variable region?
Okay, so you guys are right. It's these green regions at the top of the antibody on both sides. What are they made up of? Which chains? Light? Half of light. Yeah, half of light and part of heavy, right? Because remember, the heavy chains extend all the way. They're the longest ones. That's why they're heavy. So all of this is heavy chain. The very first portion of the heavy chain up here is variable, right? That's what makes each antibody unique. And that's where it binds to the antigen. So that's where it needs to be different. So it's different because each light chain in this section, each heavy chain in that section is different. It varies from antibody to antibody. Okay, I'm trying to think what the next one is. Oh, this is one where you have to type it in. You guys should know this one. We just talked about it. We had some late covers, so I'll go ahead and, and, and do it. So this one you gotta, if you're texting, you gotta text Erica Burns, right, to that number once to join, then you text your message. So complement protein, so right, it's going to be a C, it's going to be a number, and it's also going to be a letter, another letter for the piece of the protein. So one of these is not the correct answer. Which one's not the correct answer? C3B. Because C3B is binding the opsonin, right? C5A and C3A are correct answers. And CB is the wrong order, right? It goes C, then the number, then the fragment, either A or B. All right, I think that's my last one in this set. Oh, this one actually is relate, related to today's. Um, let's see if anybody looked ahead. I want to have you guys do this one. Actually, we'll skip it. We'll do it next time. We're getting short on time anyways. Okay. Oh, I don't think we're on cat scratch. That's to my other class. Ha <laughs> ha. I didn't open the PowerPoint. I knew I forgot something. All right, so we're on antibodies. And we've been reviewing different parts. Okay, I don't know why I did that. Okay. So last time we talked about antigens and how complex they could be. And we started talking about, and we just reviewed, the, some of the major parts of antibodies. Then we started talking about why they're beneficial, basically their outcomes. What happens once an antibody binds to an antigen, right? So we'll do some more review without using our clickers. So which protective outcome of antigen antibody binding is represented here? So antibodies are binding to a toxin in this picture, and to a virus. When we shut down toxins and viruses, what do we call this? We've done what to them? We've neutralized them. We've neutralized them. We just talked about this. When antibodies bind and a phagocytic cell comes along and engulfs it, these antibodies are acting as 
optimization is super neat? Nope. Wrong slide. This is opsonization, though, right? This is opsonization with an antibody. And again, notice where it's grabbing onto the antibody. What region of that antibody is the phagocytic cell grabbing onto? Nope. This is a, probably a macrophage. But what part of this antibody is this right here? What do we call that? The FC region. Right? It's very important. And so then the other opsin in our body produces is a complement protein, right? And that's C3, what? B for binding, right? So now, as we just quizzed you guys on, right? Opsonization with C3B. Inflammatory response, C3A and C5A, and then cell lysis via what? What do we call that complex that forms? The MAC complex, which stands for membrane attack complex. So that's what's going to happen, right, if antibodies bind and complement proteins bind to that antibody. So this is activation of complement, right, via antibodies. And which pathway is it? It is the classical pathway when antibodies bind. And in a moment, we're going to talk about which antibodies actually can do this, which class of antibodies. What productive outcome is seen here? So these are bacteria that have flagella that allow them to move, but antibodies are binding to the flagella. So what happens to these bacteria? Immobilization. Yeah, they become immobilized. The other thing that can happen too when antibodies bind to the surface of bacteria can stop them from adhering to us. So antibodies binding to bacteria can immobilize them and prevent their adherence, prevent them to, from sticking to us. That's not shown in this picture. I need a picture for that one. Though. And then this is referred to as what? Where antibodies can bind to multiple antigens at the same time and kind of clump them up. We call this cross-linking. Now, this phenomenon can also happen outside the body, and depending on what type of antigens you're dealing with, it's given different um, reaction names. So, outside the body, but also it can happen inside your body, but typically we look at these reactions outside the body. We use antibodies to help us detect antigens. So, um, you can do this for bacteria. This is used all the time for our typing blood. Right, where we use known antibodies with unknown blood to see if they match up. And when they match up, they, they cross-link like this and they clump up. And that reaction is referred to as an agglutination reaction. When you have large substances like bacteria or red blood cells. When you have soluble substances like, say, a protein that you wouldn't see in a solution or even in a gel matrix, when you add antibodies to it, it becomes a much larger complex because you get all this cross-linking happening. That soluble protein or substance will precipitate out of solution. So it'll literally fall out of a solution in a test tube or in a gel matrix that will form a line um, where you see the antigen and antibodies coming together, forming such a large complex that it actually shows a visible line that you can see with the naked eye. Anyone take biology lab here? Do you guys do the precipitation reaction? No. No? Uh, I thought somebody I did. Yeah. I thought they did. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen the prep for it 
some class does it. I've seen it in the prep lab. <laughs> Somebody's doing it. I need to find out who's doing it. Yeah. Okay. So cross-linking agglutination with large stuff, right? So we're talking about red blood cells again and bacteria. There is a class of antibody that you make called IgM. So each of the classes of antibody is given a letter designation that we're going to go over today. Each one of them starts with the abbreviation IG, and what IG stands for is immunoglobulin, right? Because these are proteins, right? They actually are globular. And again, the M stands for which class we're talking about. So in the case of IgM, when your cells, when your B cells secrete it, they secrete it in this form, in this pentamer, where you have five individual Ys that are all the same hooked together. So this is a really large antibody. And as you can see, it's cross-linking, right? It's binding with a specific section on this bacteria. What do we call that little bitty piece that the antibody binds to? the epitope, right? The epitope, or the antigenic determinant. And notice this antibody down here is binding to a different epitope, right? This is a different antibody from this antibody, right? Because it's binding to a different antigen. Oh, look, they were labeled epitopes right on the slide, y'all. <laughs> so when we test for blood type 2, when we're looking at the ABO blood group, whether you have the A antigen or the B antigen, the antibodies you make against that are this class. They're IgM. So they're really good at cross-linking a, a lot of red blood cells and creating a really good agglutination reaction. The last outcome that I thought we, that was the last one, but we didn't get to all of them last time, but that's okay. Also, we didn't have that slide. That's that. That's the one you just said. You didn't have this one? No, I'm looking at Oh. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll make sure to um, post this version for you guys. I apologize for that. Okay. It might have been one of the reiterations that didn't include it. But I, didn't I post the, the full one of this one? Not the student version? I didn't? Okay, I'll check after class and fix that. Okay, so which protective outcome of antigen antibody binding is represented in this picture? So in this picture, you have a virus-infected cell. And what happens is when viruses infect our cells, a lot of times they insert their own proteins into our membranes to make their envelopes. Right? Remember, we learned about this with viruses. So when that happens, sometimes if we have an antibody against those proteins, antibodies will bind to the surface of that cell. This is a, another way of tagging them, you could say, for destruction. But this is one of our own cells. So a phagocytic cell may come along and gobble this up, but another cell helps us out with this problem. It's called the natural killer cell. So natural killer cells, when they recognize, and it's only one class of antibody that does this, when IgG is coating the surface, the natural killer cell will attach to the FC region of that class of antibody and release cytotoxic substances and kill that virus-infected cell. This process is given the name antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So again, it's dependent on antibodies binding in order to cause the cell death, right? Cytotoxic cellular death. And only natural killer cells do this. And only the class IgG antibodies. So this also happens, and we'll talk about it again later, with hemolytic disease of the newborn. Because if you don't match the RH 
of your baby. So say your, your baby is positive and you're negative. You don't have that antigen. You get exposed to positive blood, you'll make that antibodies against that. And unfortunately, this class of antibody, IgG, crosses the placenta. So when it crosses the placenta, it can bind to the baby's red blood cells. One of the things that can happen is this. Because the baby's red blood cells are coated in the mom's IgGs, the baby's natural killer cells will attach to those antibodies and kill the baby's own cells in this process. Because the antibodies from the mom are recognizing the baby's red blood cells as being foreign. She's shaking her head. You had Rogam, huh? You're RH negative? No, no, no. I don't have a baby. Just a. Right. Yeah. Very important. So the Rogam shot is um, a preventative um, from trying, for, from um, allowing this to happen. It's actually an antibody against the um, antigens. Okay. So antibodies are pretty awesome, right? They can allow us to do some pretty powerful things. <laughs> there are some mean pathogens out there, like Streptococcus pryogens, which causes strep throat, and Streptococcus aureus, which have proteins on their surface that allow them to bind to the FC region of our antibodies. So this bacteria gets into our body and grabs onto our antibodies, at the portion that our immune system is supposed to be interacting with, right? So it's oriented in this way instead of this way. So this is the way we want to happen, right? Where the variable regions are binding to the antigen. And the FC portion is sticking out, so say maybe a phagocytic cell can come along and grab onto it. Instead, they're coating themselves in our antibodies in an orientation that our cells cannot interact with the FC portion. And instead, the variable region is sticking out. Our immune system is not going to recognize the variable region. So they're essentially coating themselves in our own proteins to evade detection. So this is where our own stuff is being used against us. So this is why we still have illness, right? Even though we have phagocytosis, it doesn't always work, right? Even though we have antibodies, they're not always able to attach and detect. Or in this case, they're being pirated, stolen, used against us. So, remember I said there are five classes, right? So, they're all abbreviated IG. That stands for immunoglobulin, another name for an antibody. And then they're given a le letter designation. So, you'll notice we have three letters. We have IgM, right? That's the class M, IgG, IgA, IgD, and IgE. Two of them, when they're secreted, by the B cells are more than just a single Y. They're more than the single monomer unit. Instead, they form these much more complex structures. So for IgM, the B cell actually secretes five monomers all hooked together in this huge complex called a pentamer. I always remember IgM, I always think M stands for mega big, right? Because this guy is huge. IgA is the class of antibody we put into all of our secretions. 
In that form, we put two of them together, we form dimers. So now we have four antigen binding sites. Where with the pentamer, we have how many antigen binding sites? Ten, right? Five times two. Ten. Can bind to a lot of antigen, as you saw there, in, in interacting with um, a lot of red blood cells in that picture. What are secretions that our body produces? Sweat is one of the ones that IGA is actually not in. Breast milk, tears, saliva, mucus, right? That's one of the big ones for us. So why do we produce it in our breast milk? Yeah, we, we want to give it to, it's protection to your infant, right? It helps coat their mucous membranes before they can start producing their own antibodies. And this is one of the reasons why nowadays there's a big movement towards breastfeeding again. Because it is, in this aspect, better than formula. Because we cannot replicate that in formula. Right? We can't put antibodies, not cheaply anyways, into formula. Right? So this is the only way to give the babies this level of immunological protection, is to breastfeed. Because we make this very special present for our babies. We continually, all the time, make it for our mucus. It's in our tears. It's in our saliva. Right? All these opening areas, right, where we really want to protect. We have tons of IgA produced and put into it. Now remember, each one of those IgAs you make is specific to a particular pathogen, right? So you can make IgA specifically against the influenza virus, right? So that if you inhale that influenza virus and the mucus that's in your nose, right, in your throat will attach to it and keep it trapped in the mucus, that virus, so that it doesn't get into your body. Instead, you push it out with the mucus through the system. It's one of the reasons why this year, although I didn't succeed, <laughs> I wanted to really see um, I wanted to do a little experiment on myself even, <laughs> uh, but maybe next year. Uh, you have the choice for the flu vaccine, right? You can get it injected, or you, there's a nasal spray. And my son's doctors, especially for little kids, right, um, sometimes not having to give them a shot, just spray something up their nose um, tends to be not so bad. My son hates having things sprayed up his nose, though. Um, so every time we go to the doctor, he's like, am I going to get the spray up the nose? <laughs> um, but I wanted the spray up the nose because think about this. If it comes into your body the same way the virus does, right, influenza, you inhale that, right? Then immunologically, hopefully you would do a protection for that route of entry. And so therefore you'd be more likely to produce IgAs. So hopefully you could trap the stuff in your mucus, right, and not have it get into your body. Where when they're injecting you with it, you're more likely to make IgG, which again is going to protect your entire body. It travels all throughout the body, can even cross the placenta. But I was wondering, you know, you know, if, you know, you would maybe get a better response, right, and what type of response would you get? It'd be an interesting graduate research project, right? Um, but my son's doctor does, he does believe that, you know, especially for little kids to, you know, it's not about not giving them a shot. It's about, you know, the route of entry and the immunological protection difference that could potentially exist there. So, but for adults, I guess it's just like impossible to find. They called around for me and they're like, 
nobody's got it right now. It's like, okay, fine, just give me the shot. I'd rather be protected <laughs> than, than, um, than try out this if it makes a difference. So that's one of those things, you know, to really kind of think about and definitely think about too a little bit later when we, we talk about um, allergy and hypersensitivities and, and the different antibodies that are involved in that. So usually my students remember IgE, right, because I suffer from nasal allergies, uh, hay fever like allergies. So every once in a while I'm stuffed up like I am now, even though I took my Flonase this morning and my Allegra, right. Sometimes it just isn't enough for what's out there. For what we're allergic to. Um, this one is the one that's the mediator for allergic reactions is IgE. So I always joke with my students, don't, don't forget how much Erica, E for Erica, hates her IgEs, <laughs> right, that are responsible for my allergic response. So your B cells have the antibody that they make on their surface and it is of this class IgM. When they secrete it, though, they secrete it in this pentamer form. And this is the first antibody you make. Even an infant makes IgMs. But this is so big, it does not leave the bloodstream typically. And again, therefore, it does not cross the placenta either. So you don't have to worry about this antibody as it relates to your baby and matching your baby as far as the ABO blood group because this one does not cross. IgG, on the other hand, is always made as a monomer, and because it's so much smaller, and it's really our main protective antibody that pretty much goes everywhere, it does cross the placenta. And of course, it's meant to help protect the baby, but in the case of RH, it can be detrimental. IgA in your serum, so in the liquid phase of your blood, it's found as this monomer. But most of the IgA you produce, you secrete. And it's secreted in this dimer form. IgD we don't know much about. And then IgE, as I said, this is the one for allergic reactions. Um, so it interacts with cells that mediate that type of response. But they are in the monomer form. So let's look at each one of these individually. So as I said, IgM, it's the first antibody to respond to infection. This is the first one you're going to make most of the time. Stays in the bloodstream though, too big, right? When it's secreted, its structure is this huge pentamer five monomer units, 10 antigen binding sites. It's found on the surface of our B cells as a monomer. It's actually what we call our B cell receptor. It's the only antibody that can be found, formed, excuse me, by the fetus. So in utero, this is the only one they're making is Ig. You make this against what we refer to as T-independent antigens. So these are antigenic substances, foreign substances, that your B cells will make this class of antibody against without any T cell help, right? T cells are not involved in the process of getting the B cell to make IgM. Some antigens and some to make other classes of antibodies, you need T cell involvement with the B cell. And this is, this is a process of how B cells are activated, right? Turn into plasma cells and actually secrete antibodies is something we're going to talk about coming up. IgG. This is your most predominant, especially in circulation and throughout your body. And it is secreted as that single monomer. It is the only antibody that crosses the placenta. It's present also in the colostrum. What's the colostrum? It's the first milk 
right, that a mom makes. It is chock full of all the IgGs she knows how to make. She passes this on to her baby. This is one of the very first presents you give your baby. So even though, right, you may not or, or, or don't have the ability maybe to breastfeed, in the hospital they'll still try and encourage you that while you're in the hospital, that first milk that you produce to try and give it to your baby. Those antibodies will stay around in your baby's system for about a month. So this is going to give them very good protection. This is also why I can't believe, right? Babies are vulnerable. Their system isn't quite up to par yet, right? This is why, as a mom, you're giving them all this stuff, right? In the classroom, you're giving them all your IgGs. Everything you've been vaccinated against, anything you've been exposed to, your system makes a whole bunch of IgGs just to give to your baby. And then continually as you breastfeed, you give them IgA to help coat their digestive system and, and respiratory before, you, before they can start doing it on their own. So I see these people who go to places like Walmart, right, with a two-week-old. Really? You couldn't get somebody to watch that kid, right? Dad stay home, mom goes, mom stays home, dad goes grocery shopping, right? You do not want to expose children to other people at this very young age. Not large numbers of strange people you don't know, right? And, and the thing is, is even I have this hard time, right? You see a baby, right? I even, men, right, gravitate to babies. It's not just women, right? When you see a baby, you want to go up and look at it, right? And breathe in its poor little face, right? I have to re resist and stand back and go, oh, it's such a pretty baby. How old is it? Oh, really? Right? You should be home. Right? <laughs> you should not be out right now. <laughs> right? Um, you don't want to be exposing them, right, to, to all these things that people carry. Right? Stay home. Get someone else to watch you while right? someone else goes grocery shopping for the first couple of months. Right? Don't unnecessarily expose them to all the god-awfuls out there. I'm respectful. I don't stick my face in their face, but not everyone else is, right? Everyone wants to see that baby. It's not a good idea. So this is your antibody and memory. This one sticks around for a really long time, right? And you can in and um, it can really help you out in that aspect. This abbreviation you saw earlier, right? It's one of our protective outcomes that IgG can do. It's antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So it's dependent on this class of antibody, just IgG. And who is the lymphocyte that's going to come along and kill a cell that's coded in these IgGs? He's going to kill it. He's a lymphocyte. Natural killers. As their name implies, they naturally kill. The next antibody, why is it not listed? There we go. Because they got tagged with the spelling out. My animation's messed up. I guess I could fix it right now, huh? I don't know how to get... There we go. Siri, really? You're not sure? I was like, I use Siri all the time. Y'all check spelling. All right? So sometimes I'll just say a, a statement to her. And, and last night I said a statement, and she's like, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I was like, it's okay, Siri. I don't need you to do that. I just need you to make check my spelling for me. Because <laughs> she types out whatever you say to her. And she'll respond. Okay, so IgA, let me see if my animation's working. Okay, 
is um, very, it's not very abundant in your circulation, but that's not its job, right, to be in your blood. Its job is to be in your secretions. So it is probably the most abundant antibody we produce because we put produce god awful amounts, right, of, of <laughs> mucus daily and tears and saliva. I saw a figure somewhere, but I can't remember it. But yeah, it's it's a lot. It'll blow your mind how much we produce um, in general. So most abundant, and this guy is really important for that um, attachment problem, right? That microbes, right, viruses, bacteria have got to stick to us, usually to be able to establish, to stay put, and, and cause infection. So if our antibodies bind to them first, or our antibodies bind to their flagella in the mucus, we can immobilize them, we can stop them from adhering to us. And so that, that this antibody is really important in that protective outcome of immobilizing, that making it stay put in the mucus so that we push it where we want it to go and it doesn't swim past and through the mucus. And for us to bind to it before it binds to us, right? Have those antibodies coat it and stop it from binding to us. So again, it can coat viruses and toxin as well and neutralize them. Right? If we can keep them stuck in that mucus, keep them from attaching to us, then they can't cause infection. So that's where, like I said, I, you know, I would like to try and get my body to produce a whole bunch of IgAs against the flu so that I can trap it in my mucus and push it out of the system and it doesn't even get in to begin with. The next class, IgD, is found as a monomer. It is a mature, you've seen it in mature antibody responses. And the last iteration of our textbook, even, we, you know, we didn't have much information on these guys. So there's, we're still actively studying this particular class of antibody. What's its role? Why do we see it now at that time in mature antibody responses? What is it doing? IgE is barely detectable in circulation, so you know you won't really find it in your blood for most people. I'm not one of them, right? Because this guy um, typically will hang out in the tissues and it will attach to mast cells and basophils. And so for allergic sensitized individuals like myself that have been exposed to something and our, my system produced IgEs against it, my IgEs then bind to the mast cells. So that when I then inhale that pollen again, it binds to the antibodies. Because notice the orientation here, the FC region is binding to the mast cell. And again, it, it's only IgE that does this because that FC portion is recognized by these cells, right? So these cells grab onto just IgGs and they coat themselves in them when the IgEs are produced. And for weeks, they stay attached to these cells. So then when you inhale again that pollen, it binds to these antibodies that are already attached to the effector cells. These cells immediately degranulate, right? They release their, their vesicles, and they contain substances that tend to be inflammatory, like histamine. Because we think invasion is happening, right? They're like, oh, this is something foreign. This is not me. We need to respond. So we're going to need white blood cells to do that, right? We're going to get inflammation. The only problem is the pollen granule going to grow in your body. right? This is a false alarm to the system, unfortunately. And some of us are more prone to this than not because how does your immune system know how to function? All this information is encoded in your what? In your DNA. So the tendency to go this route is inherited, right? So I have my good old mom to thank and my son has poor me to thank for our allergies. But there is hope, right? 
There are drugs. There are treatments. There is knowledge, right? Knowledge is power. Right? So before I go out, especially right now, right, I take my allergy medicine. So that's already in my system. So that when, right, I inhale those pollen granules and they get to these guys, I've got antihistamines, anti medications that are going to quiet the response. They're going to go, no, 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 we don't need that right now. <laughs> False alarm, right? Cool your jets. Turn off the sprinkler system, right? Not necessary right now. Right, so um, we change over time, don't we? Right, so maybe other times when you're, you were exposed, you may have mounted an immunological response, but it wasn't so much that you noticed, noticed. Each time you get exposed, your immune system gets more aggressive, right? So uh, upon each subsequent exposure, you're producing more IgEs and more IgEs. So like for me, when I went through testing, and we'll talk about later, um, they skin test it. They'll actually poke into your skin, right? And then the reaction will happen in your skin. Um, the last time when I was really, really sick, I said to the doctor, I was like, I'll go through therapy again if I have to because I'm just miserable. And, and he said, well, you know, um, we don't have to do the skin testing. You've been through that before. But let's get an idea of where you're at, where the last therapy worked, right, and where you're at. And because I'm such an allergic individual, they could actually take my blood and test for and see what IgEs I have against the, the major allergens that are out there that people are allergic to. So one of the ones, because of the therapy that I went through, I'm not really allergic to anymore. It didn't show up in my profile. Uh, unfortunately, still very allergic to ragweed, though. It's kind of one of those things you can't avoid. Um, and I didn't do treatment long enough to not be allergic to that one anymore. So there is a way of desensitizing the system. People go for what's called allergy shots. And I went through that for about six months. Yes, I'm not allergic to thistle anymore. Um, I produced enough IgEs against it that I stopped that cycle. Um, IgG. And that's the thing is they inject what you're allergic to, your own special cocktail. They inject it into you. So your body produces IgGs. So that when it gets into your system, hopefully your IgGs attack it first and it doesn't go to your IgEs. And we can stop that cycle of keep going IgE, IgG, IgG, IgG. It's called desensitization. And you can do it naturally too. If you get local honey that hasn't been um, uh, filtered, um, it has pollen in it. You can take a, t a teaspoon of, of pollen each day, right, by taking a teaspoon of local honey. And you want to do local because you want to do what's in the area, right, the pollen that's in your area. Um, and I have friends that have sworn by it, said so it's made a huge difference for them. And again, you're desensitizing the system. You're, you're trying to get it to produce IgAs or IgGs, something other than IgE, because that's the one that binds to these mast cells and basophils. I was going to ask what they bind to. Yeah, IgEs only bind to mast cells and basophils, and that's why you get that reaction. Oh, no, basophils have serious significance when, as it relates to allergy, for sure. Okay, all right, so, and it was there. <laughs> Sorry, forgot I had animated it. <laughs> but good spelling, thank you, Bridget, for helping me so I could drink. <laughs> all right, so five classes, right? Number one that we make that's on the surface of our B cells, IgM, but when it's secreted, it's that huge pentamer. Right? When we secrete it, it stays in our blood, doesn't cross the placenta. Really good at that cross-linking. And then remember, which one do we secrete as a dimer? IgA, right? And it's probably the one that we make the most of. Because we make so much of our secretions. And what are our secretions? Breast milk, mucus, tears, saliva.
So this is a good table, right, that summarizes major components and has the pictures. You guys don't have that? Yeah, I guess I'm going to put, I'm going to post this whole PowerPoint that I'm using right now. I don't know why I, it didn't get posted for you guys. I apologize. But remember, you know, that's a good way for organizing information to see if you can generate a table like this on your own, right? See what you remember. So this is a picture of all the different um, protective outcomes that can happen when antigens and antibodies bind. I'm going to add in a few more details here because now that we've learned about the different classes of antibodies, not all of these outcomes happen with all the different classes of antibodies, right? Some of them are pretty particular to a particular class of antibodies. So IgAs, remember, in our secretions, IgG is all throughout our body, and IgM is, is that protection, you could say, in our blood because it's too big to really leave the bloodstream. So what kind of protection can these antibodies give us? These general, our top three, you could say, are really good at neutralization, right? Because they can bind to viruses and toxins in our secretions in the form of IgA. If it gets into our body anywhere, IgG can um, bind to it. And if it's in our blood, IgM is going to bind to it and stop those viruses and toxins from binding to us. And that's what we do. That's how we protect us against the tetanus toxin, right? The vaccine they give you is actually a, a, a weakened form of the toxin so that your body will make antibodies against it. So your antibodies can neutralize it if you get an infection with tetanus. The next is immobilization and prevention of adherence, right? So we can immobilize bacteria by having antibodies bind. IgA can do this very effectively in mucus. IgM can do it in our blood, and IgG will take care of the rest. It will also stop them from adhering to us. So two very important outcomes, right, that can really save us with invasion by microbes. The next is cross-linking, right? All these antibodies can cross-link. They, they can bind to at least two antibodies. Can eat at least one antibody can bind to two antigens at the same time, right? It's got two arms, basically. And the one that's the best at binding to a lot of antigen is which one? IgA, IgG, or IgM? Which one can bind to a lot of antigen? IgM, because remember, IgM looks like what? That mega big huge pentamer. It can bind to 10 antigens. One antibody molecule can bind to up to 10 antigens at the same time. Now I forget where I go in my animation on this. So Antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, remember, only one class of antibody participates in this outcome, and that's IgG. Only IgG, FC region, that portion that sticks out, does the natural killer cells have a receptor for. Right? So only that specific interaction. But again, with hemolytic disease of the newborn, right, that's the class of antibody we make. IgG. So this can happen. This is one of the ways the baby's red blood cells gets destroyed is because it gets coated in these antibodies and the baby's natural killer cells kill their own red blood cells. So what do you think about for opsonization? What class of antibody you think would be good at this? So for opsonization, we're, we're on antibodies binding, we're tagging it for destruction, and a phagocytic cell has to come along and grab onto the FC portion of that antibody and engulf it. IgG. Why not IgA? Yeah, IgA is usually not even in our body, right? It's in our secretions. So if it's in our secretions, are the phagocytic cells going to be able to get to it? No. Right? And IgM doesn't look like this, right, when it's secreted. It's that big, huge pentamer. 
So IgG, right, IgG participates in opsonization and antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Plus, remember, we talked about it here, right? It can neutralize, it can cross-link, and it can immobilize. So IgG is, is just about every single one of these outcomes, right? And in fact, it is all, it can do all of these. The last one is complement activation. Remember, where are complement proteins mainly? In their inactive form. Where are they in our bodies? In the blood, right? And they'll leak into our tissues during inflammation. So IgG can activate them, right? Because IgG is everywhere. But one other class of antibody can activate complement via the classical pathway. It's the one in your blood. Because remember, this is happening in your blood or your tissues. So IgA is not going to help you because where is IgA? It's pretty much in your secretions, right? It's IgM, right? Your number one first class of antibody, your main protector. IgM and IgG can activate complement via the classical pathway. Remember, with complement activation, we can get more opsonization with C3B. We get an inflammatory response, and we can even get cell lysis by that MAC complex. I think that's the end of this PowerPoint, right? Yay, so a good time to end, right? Can you guys see why the antibodies are my absolute favorite? They're pretty cool, huh? They're pretty powerful, pretty specific, awesome little proteins.